Judges 13, verse 1. And the people of Israel again did what was evil, circle evil, in the sight of the Lord, so that the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years, circle 40 years. There was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren, but have not and have not borne children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor, circle razor, no razor shall go upon his head for the child shall be a Nazarite, circle Nazarite, to God from birth. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, a man of God came to me and his appearance was like the appearance of an angel of God. Very awesome. I didn't ask him where he was from and he didn't tell me his name, but he said to me, behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, underline this phrase, to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, Please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us, underline the sentence, and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran and quickly told her husband, Behold, the woman who, or the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me again. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, are you the man who spoke with this woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, now when your words come true, underline this phrase, what is to be the child's manner of life and what is his mission? Circle mission. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine. Let her not drink wine or strong drink or eat of unclean things. All that I have commanded her, let her observe. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, if you detain me, I will not eat your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that it was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name, circle name, so that when your words come true, we may honor you, circle honor. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? seeing that it is wonderful, circle wonderful. So Manoah took the young goat and the grain offering and offered it on a rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching and they fell on their faces to the ground. And the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife. Then Manoah knew that he had seen the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die for we have seen God, circle God. But his wife said to him, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands or shown us all these things or now announced to us such things as these. And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson, circle Samson. And the young man grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir, circle stir in him in Manan Dan between Zorah and Estael. I would wonder if I was to rewind your last year of 2020, if we were to walk alongside of you as you interacted online, as you interacted with your husband or with your wife or with your kids, what your conversations were about. You know, sometimes Facebook says, hey, nine years ago, you posted this. And then I look back on it and I go, why the heck did I post that? Or like things that were funny 10 years ago are like totally lame right now. I wonder if we were to catalog every conversation and everything that was important to you in 2020, what your high values were. Because we could tell. We could tell by what you posted and what you talked about, what consumed your mind. And chances are, it had something to do with 
politics, our president or lack thereof, our health situation, or we might die, or maybe we'll survive. Who should wear a mask? Who shouldn't wear a mask? Finances. Hey, businesses should be open. This is America. Now businesses should be closed because we don't want people to die. Churches should be open or they should be closed. Literally, this last year has been a year full of disruption. Screaming for your attention. Hey, you know what's important? This thing over here. Hey, 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 look. And we're going to look at something today through the story of the birth of Samson that I hope changes the way you and I think about when bad things happen to us in our personal lives, in our nation. Because it'll help you literally for the rest of your life when you go through hard times. I hope you remember this moment. If you got your notes, pull them out. They should be in your bulletin that you got on your way in. If you're watching online, if you're on Facebook with us, at the top of the comment section is a link. Click on that link and my notes will drop down. And number one is this, God births disruption. What? Yep. God births disruption, which means this. If I was to ask you, does the presence of COVID in the world shake your confidence in the fact that there's a God? Because for many people, it does. For many people, they would say this. The fact that COVID's here means that God doesn't exist. The fact that people have died in my life in 2020 means that God doesn't care about me. The fact that I lost a lot of money in 2020 means that God doesn't care about my family. The fact that we're going through these stresses and anxieties means that if the God that you say exists actually exists, that he would do something about these problems. He either doesn't exist or he's too inept to actually handle it. Well, actually, there's a different way to think about what's going on. And it's this idea. When God brings difficulty, does he have a purpose? And here's the key, ready? Many of us have been told this our whole lives. Hey, if there's problems, then that just doesn't mean there's a God. Like there's no God, obviously, because there's issues. There's evil in the world. But I'm gonna break something down for you and I hope it changes the way you think about when issues hit your life, like it's literally happening to all of us right now. Number one, God births disruptions. God will bring difficulty into your life and in my life. And let's see what happened here in Israel because they're going through a disruption themselves, the nation of Israel 3,000 years ago. Because of Israel's disobedience, the Philistines who were their neighbors ruled over them for 40 years. Instead of appreciating what he did and continuing to follow and love the true God, The Israelites drifted away spiritually over time. Israel replaced the true God who wanted their faith with gods they could feel. Uh Uh-oh. Everybody ready? Here's one of the most difficult parts of living. God made us sensory creatures. We, We believe things because we can see them, touch them, taste them, hear them. And for many people, they go, you know, I believe in science. You hear that a lot when you deal with atheists or when you deal with agnostics. Maybe you're an atheist here right now and you're, or you're an agnostic. And one of my main hangups as an atheist is that, you know, if I can't, I believe in science. I don't just believe in faith and just random things I can't see. To which I always say to them, that's not true. Because some of the things that you value the most in life, you can't see, touch, taste, or feel. How about love? How about justice? How about forgiveness? You can't see, touch, taste those things, yet they're the, they're the things that give value to living. They're the things you hear screamed about on social media all the time. Like those are the things people care about, not I touched my shoes today. I guess they're real. <laughs> what do people care about? I care about being loved. I care about being accepted. I care about people, getting justice. If, I've, if unjust things have happened to me, like, but you can't touch, see, taste those things but those are the things that people care about the most. So it's untrue that you live your life only for your five senses. What's true is this. You and I live our lives based on things that we can't see, touch, taste, or hear. Those are the things that give depth to our life, not just this stuff. And right here, 
in Judges 13, the nation of Israel, they have the true God. Watch how crazy this is. If you've ever wondered, I wonder if there's a true God in the world. Like, does he interact in the real world? Like, yeah, all the way through the Old Testament, God is interacting in real time, space, history. Uh, God shows up to Moses at the burning bush, tells him, go rescue my people, Israel, from being slaves in Egypt. Moses goes, rescues them, brings them out. God gives them, physically speaks in the world, the 10 commandments and all the other laws, physically writes it down on stone. Israel has the only true God that's ever really spoken into history because he's the only God that exists. Ra and all the other pantheon of gods in Israel or in uh, Egypt, they don't exist. They've never spoken in the world. The, the God of the Phoenicians or the Philistines or any of these other ancient nations don't exist and they don't speak in real time space history. But the nation of Israel had the true God. And watch this. They had the real God, but because God wasn't feely enough for them, they started to drift away from him and make idols, things that they could touch, see, taste, pray to. And that's, that's, a, that's a snare for all of us. In our day and age, we don't really bow down to idols that we make, but you know what we do? We have, all of us have idols in our life. And you go, what do you mean by that? I'll tell you what an idol is. An idol is anything that distracts your attention away from the true God. Could be politics, could be um, mask wearing, could be health, could be your finances, could be whatever. Chances are you told everybody what was important to you in 2020. Oh, you want to kill grandma? You better wear a mask. I'm not going to wear a mask. This is America. This is America. I'm going to keep my business open. This is America. You should close your business. Or you're going to kill our, you're going to kill our, our valley. Trump's the best president that ever existed. Trump is the worst thing that ever happened to America. Uh, mitten, mitten wearing man. <laughs> He's the best thing that ever happened to America. Good old mitten wearing Bernie. He's the worst thing ever. The point is, is that everybody had an opinion this last year about something. And guess what? You told people what that opinion was. And you know what's sad? Most of you cared more about other things that don't last into eternity than you cared about telling people about the eternal God that loves them. And that's a travesty. You know what that means? That means that you might know the true God, but you started to drift from your attention and you got distracted by shiny things over here. And instead of telling people about hope and in Christ and in Jesus, we got caught up in politics and social issues and all these things which have a level of importance, but they don't have ultimate importance. Because people are going to die and not know Jesus. And our job is to say, are these things important? Sure, they're important, but they're not ultimately important. You need to know Jesus. And many of us got distracted. and We drifted away from our, our primary reason for existing, which is telling people about the goodness of God through Jesus. And it happened to Israel. They knew the true God and they started to drift. And here's our principle, Ready? you will drift away from whatever you're not focused on. Woo! Look at it with your own two eyes and focus on it if you still have good enough eyes to see that. You will drift away from whatever you're not focused on. And many of us drifted away from God in 2020. We got caught up. We got caught up screaming about stuff online or with our neighbors or our family that literally doesn't matter in eternity. We got suckered. We got suckered into, hey, look at this shiny thing over here. And we took our focus off of Jesus. Now people know us as being a Republican or a Democrat or a mitten-wearing independent or whatever. And they don't know us as being a follower of Jesus. They know where we stand on masks, but they don't know where we stand on Jesus. And that's sad. Because that's a focus issue. You got suckered. I got suckered. You look back on the things you posted in 2020, and if it wasn't about Jesus, it doesn't have lasting value. It's just temporary, which that has some importance, but it's not ultimately important. Seeing them abandon the God who loved and cared for them, God gave them over to trusting in the non-existent gods they worshiped, all the idols they made. You're gonna trust in your non-existent gods? Go ahead. To punish them, the Philistines, their next door neighbors, were allowed to overtake them and disrupt their lives. 
Cultural disruption isn't a sign of God's non-existence or ineptitude. In other words, that he's not powerful enough to to overtake something, but is often his method of spiritual awakening. Woohoo! Ready? I'm going to go after something. Hey, atheists, ready? Here we go. Agnostics, you ready? I don't even know if there is a God. Okay, we're going to walk down that road. Ready? You're watching me online? Turn up the volume. So this last year, I try to keep everybody focused on Jesus. As a pastor, that happens to be my job. So I post a lot of things, a lot of our videos, um, little just things from my sermon. And I'd post little, pe- like, um, little memes or whatever. And one of them was, you know, hey, pray, pray that God brings you know, COVID to a close and that we can get back to worshiping together, blah, blah. This is like before Christmas. It was like, I think, November of last year. Well, it goes all over the world. People, people comment on it. Amen. Hey, that's great. You know, hey, we're praying for that too, blah, blah, blah. Well, every once in a while, you'll get a, a, a friend who thinks all Christians are idiots and unintellectual and haven't thought through the, the issues. And so they'll post stuff on the comments below things I posted, right? You've seen it, like it's just spam and people trying to cause issues. Well, this got posted on one of the posts that I posted last year. And what's interesting about this is this speaks to our cultural reality where people say this in their minds, ready? And this is, this is a constant atheistic, agnostic type of thing. If your God was real, bad stuff wouldn't happen. If your God was powerful, he'd get rid of COVID. If the God you're talking about, God loves people. Yep, God wants the best for people. Uh Uh-huh. If that God existed, pandemics wouldn't happen. Evil wouldn't be in the world. I wouldn't have got molested when I was a child. Like things, things would be different if your God actually existed. You know what the problem with that, logically with the problem with that, with that, uh, that idea is, is this. Number one, you have zero idea how many pandemics God stopped that you didn't have to go through. The fact that a pandemic exists is not a defeater for God existing. The fact a pandemic exists might be this, that God's getting your attention in a way that you wouldn't if, there, if you lived in ease like you did in 2019. In fact, it's most times when challenge comes into our lives that we change. And God uses things that we call evil to go, it's time to wake up. It's time to stop living the way you've been living and live different. And you know how I change the majority of the time is you got to come at me with a pitchfork. Change. Because all of us just want to live our own lives. We want to live untouched, narcissistic. Everything's about me. It's me time. All the time. Every day. And you know how I break out of that? Normally it isn't like, hey, you need to stop being more like that. It's more like this, stop being like that. And God uses difficulty in my life to, to mold my heart. And where it's hard, he, he uses difficulty to break it. Where it's soft, he molds it. But God is out for good. And just because difficulty exists doesn't mean that God's not, not real or not good. Sometimes, ready, he's doing things you don't understand. And that bothers humans because we want God to inform us what he's doing. And guess what? That's why he's God and we're not. So the fact that a pandemic exists doesn't mean God doesn't exist. In fact, that's an arrogant statement to make for a couple of reasons. One is this, you have, uh, you have no understanding as a human how many things God, how much evil God has kept out of your life. I hope there's a day when you're dead and I'm dead that God goes, hey, you know how you complained about me all the time and said I wasn't real? because some bad thing happened or you lost some money or somebody unfriended you on Facebook or whatever you said, this is why God doesn't exist. Let me show you all the things I kept, all the evil I kept from happening in your life. And you're gonna, I hope that day, I hope God does that. Here's your alternative universe that you could have lived through all of this evil, but I filtered it all out because I loved you. That's an arrogant way to look at living, thinking you know more about the universe than the God who runs it, thinking he doesn't exist because if he did exist, things would go my way, which is God would do what I want him to do, which is get rid of pandemics and everybody live happy and blah, blah, blah. Nope, there's a reason God allows difficulty in your life. You know why things are hard? Isn't because God doesn't exist and isn't because he uh, isn't powerful enough to get rid of evil and bad. 
Many times, hard times and evil and bad things happen in your life because it forces us to change in ways that we wouldn't if it, if it wasn't here. God is true, God is real, God is love, and difficulty does exist. All of those things are true in one moment. Moving on, here we go. Ready? Here's our principle. Disruption in our lives isn't a lack of presence or power of God, but rather a plan with a purpose. God has a plan for COVID. Guess what? I lost people in my life. I buried people this last year. We had sickness run through. We had heartache. We had, we had issues. And sometimes we think, man, if I'm really a follower of God, uh, I shouldn't have hard times. And that's just not true. You ever heard of Jesus? <laughs> if there's ever a guy that's like, if I do things right, bad things won't happen. Well, that's Jesus. He did everything right and he was sinless and he still had issues. People still gossip behind his back. People still hated him for no reason. And they stuck him to a piece of wood. It literally crucified the most perfect man who's ever lived. So here's my point to you. And Paul the apostle, the greatest Christian who ever lived, who wrote about half of your New Testament, was tortured and beaten and got his head cut off by the Romans. And you think, man, godly people shouldn't have bad times. Oh no, they do. The issue isn't, are you gonna have bad times? The issue is in hard times, what lesson are you learning? Because hard times will either make you, ready, I'm gonna use a colloquialism, if you can even spell that, ready? Hard times will either make you bitter or better. It'll make you bitter, like there can't be a God because this wouldn't happen. Or it'll make you like, wow, God's trying to do something in me that I need to, I need to get my life straight. You know what's happened with COVID? Is a lot of people starting to realize their mortality. People are running scared. And they go, man, ICUs are full. Like if I get sick, I got a breathing problem, I could die. And you know what? Sometimes these moments are the moments where people go, hey, there's an eternity, time to wake up. When if we're just living our old cakey lives in Temecula, everything's sweet, dude, look at the weather, praise God. Like we live in one of the best places in the world. And then like when one little bad thing happens, oh, there's no God. It's immaturity and arrogance and narcissism that would lead us that way because we just want things to be our way. God's out for our good. And many times our good is through difficulty. And that's what's happening here with Israel. They've sinned against God. God brings the Philistines in. And now in their difficulty, God's trying to train them to let go of their idols and refocus on him. When God decided to finally rescue them, he appeared to Manoah's wife and prophesied that she would have a son to rescue the people. Even with this news, it would be 20 years before he would be ready. So watch this. God shows up and goes, hey, I know you've never had a baby, but guess what? I'm God. I, I'm the one who creates babies. You get to participate, but I build children. Isn't this amazing? Great times. So now I'm going to create a baby, and that baby is going to grow up to be a man who's going to rescue the people of Israel and kick the Philistines out. You know the problem with that? is you got to wait for a little zygote to divide his little cells. Build a little arm, build a little leg, build a little two eyeballs, la, 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 la. Month after month, building a little baby in Manoah's wife, la, 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 la. Wow, this is taking a minute or months or wow, la, 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 la. We're still in disruption, God. Cells are dividing, cells are dividing. The genetics is happening inside Manoah's wife. You like my song? So like over time, imagine this, like Manoah's wife's like, sweet, we're going to get rescued from the Philistines. Yeah, about that. It's going to take about 20 years before he becomes a man. I thought you meant like, like right now we were going to get out of this mess. Yeah, we are. See, I got a whole thing about that, that we're going to wait till Samson's grown up. And ready? Here's our principle that you're not going to like, but we're going to look at it anyway. God's plan can take time but it always arrives on time. We always want God to fix it right now. I got an issue. Fix it right now. Well, then you're not God. Nope. God goes, hey, I got a plan for everybody. And it's going to take time and time and time.
And we hate that. We live in an instant culture. We hate it when our meal takes longer than 13 seconds in a microwave. What's wrong with this microwave? I should have been ready by nine seconds. I got to wait an extra four seconds. It's ridiculous. I hate this thing. We live in a culture of like, if it's not right now, and it, if it doesn't suit me and what I want, ah, oh, it's bad. Nope, God takes time. You know what it's a lot like? It's a lot like going to a train station and you've never been on a train. And you sit down at, on the deck of the train station and you go, I wonder if a train exists because I haven't seen it or sat on one. But then you know what? You look at the ground and you go, well, there's train tracks and somebody built this train station. So that would lead me to believe there's probably a train. I wish the train was here now, but the train's taken a minute or a longer or years. But guess what? Because I trust that Somebody told me that the train comes here because they've seen a train. They work here in the station. I'm going to trust who's interacted with the train and everything's built for a train. So I trust in what I know is true. And in time, I will interact with God. God will show up on time in my life. I may think it's late, but it's never late. Samson's got to grow up. We want it right now, but it's actually 20 years later after this. Number one, God births disruption. And number two, here's the good part. God births the Savior. Does God bring hardship into our lives? Yep, but he's got a time limit on our hardship. God births the Savior. There's going to be a time when your hardship ends. There's going to be a time when COVID is gone. Praise God. There's going to be a time when hopefully we all go back to just being free and open and doing what we need to do and nobody has to live in anxiety or paranoia or fear. We don't yell at each other anymore about mass things or businesses being open or churches being open or whatever. Like we can go back to living lives of freedom. But until that time comes, there are lessons for us to learn in these moments. God births the Savior. After she tells her husband about the encounter, Manoah prays that God will send the man to inform them about how to raise their son. Uh-oh, everybody look. I'm gonna walk right into your lives. Everybody look at me with your eyeballs. Ready? I'm going to walk right into your home right now. I'm going to walk right into your home. Everybody get ready because I'm coming in and I didn't knock. Okay? So if you, have, if you have kids, if you're a parent and you have kids, whether little rugrats or big rugrats in your, in your home, okay? Or maybe you're a grandparent that you're raising your kids' kids. So your kids are MIA with their children or they're on drugs or they're in, in jail or whatever. And you as a grandparent got to raise your kids' kids, whatever situation you're in. If it's a parenting situation, I want you to listen to me. Ready? Here's our principle. A parent's first calling is to disciple their children as they are on loan from the Lord. Woo! Woo! This is going to change the way you parent. I'm telling you right now, it's changed the way I parented my son. Here's, here's what we think. I created my kids. They are mine. They look like me, which praise God, God genetically works your kids out to look somewhat like you so you don't throw them in the street sometimes because they look so much like you, like, I guess I better keep them. So it's God's mercy sometimes that he makes families like somewhat look alike. So you kind of like, hey, this is my family. But understand this, you may have participated in the creation of those children, but children are, are a gift of God. You didn't create life, God builds life. And I love that the angel shows up here and goes, hey, I know you haven't been able to have kids, but guess what? I'm creating a kid in you because I'm God. I build children. And this, this should change the way you parent. Listen to me right now. Your kids are on loan to you from God. Your job is to disciple them to love Jesus. If you're a lover of Jesus, you want them to love Jesus. Ready? That means this. Your kids need to see Jesus in your home. And that directly relates to how mom and dad interact if there's a mom and dad together, okay? So watch. You train your daughter, mom, how to be a wife every day she's at home with you. We spend the first 20 years of our lives getting trained by our parents how to handle relationships. 
we spend the next 60 years of our lives either working with that dysfunction or through that dysfunction. So my encouragement to you is this. For all of us, we build bad habits in our life. Ready? Your habits guide your life. The habits you've created literally point your life in a certain direction. Are they godly habits? They'll point you towards God and godliness and good things and blessing. If you have bad habits, I like to drink a little bit or a lot. I like to smoke a lot or a little bit. I, when I get mad, profanity just flies out of my mouth. When I get super mad, people get scared because I tell them I'm going to kill them. And, and people, get, people run. So I've got an anger issue. I got, I got habitual issues, blah, blah, blah. Whatever your thing is, listen to me. Your habits, uncorrected, will lead you in a direction. If it's bad and away from God, it'll break your marriage up. It'll make dysfunctional parenting. It'll break all the good in your life. Your habits, whatever your habits are, 2020 has exposed your habits. You've gone back to things that you thought you didn't deal with anymore. So watch, stress induces the, the habits that are, that are still inside our hearts. If they are godly, they'll guide you toward God and a healthy marriage and healthy parenting. If they are not healthy, you're training your kids how to interact. Your daughter growing up in your home will treat her husband as she saw mom treat dad. Screaming, yelling, disrespect, throwing plates like Tron. Um, <laughs> same thing with your boys as they come up in the home will treat their wife or children, those weaker than them, the way they've seen dad. So if dad is, is very violent or angry or people get scared when dad starts getting nuts, that's how you train your son to treat his wife. Because the habits you build at home is how you train your kids. Look at this. Write this down if you're a parent or you got your grandparent, you got your own, your kids' kids. Proverbs 22.6. Proverbs 22.6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not what? Depart from it. This is, a, this is literally a verse of habits. Train up, you know how you train up your child? is literally the things you do with them every day. You know what you do with them every day? It's just the mundane things of putting lucky charms on the table and how we interact with one another. We love one another or we hate one another or how we talk to one another. That's literally, you're literally for 20 years, you are the main trainer of your child as a parent. Because why? Because God loaned you kids. He loaned you a human to raise. And so we either raise them according to God and get them to church and get them to hear God's word and get them around godly people or we just kind of go, oh, that stuff's not important to me. Why in the world do you think your kids are gonna make God important to them when it's not important to you, son? You're the leader of your home, son. And you expect your kids to be like, man, I hope my kids turn out better than me. They're not going to. They're gonna probably be a worse version of you until a pastor like me has to help them weed through all the dysfunction that you've been placed in their life. Unless you and I change our habits. That you, you speak lovingly to your wife. That he sees when stress happens, you take care of your family rather than try to cut them down. That you as a wife totally come alongside your husband and you're supportive of your husband and, and, and loving and caring and, and, and respectful of your husband. So your, your daughters see that so that their future marriage will be blessed and not dysfunctional. Like all you have to do is change your habits. It's not impossible. You can do it. I, I had to do it. I grew up in a stinking Norwegian home where we hardly uttered four words to each other. We were like some hard-headed Nordic Norwegians. I mean, I got Viking blood in me, which we just basically butcher people and say, thanks for coming. Ready? I had to start showing love and being soft and being compassionate and saying how much I loved my son and my wife rather than them just having to absorb some mystical thing that they didn't know. No, I had to change the way I lived as a man. And guess what? It blessed my life. It changed, it changed how God interacted in my life. It changed how God used our family. Train up a child in the way he should go. All it is is habits. Get into God's word. Speak to each other in a godly, loving way. Even in difficulty, love your spouse, love your kids, and kids, love your parents. Thinking that he's a prophet, when Manoah asks his name so he can give this man credit later when his stuff comes true, the man references his name as wonderful. As the angel visited Gideon, 
When the man ascends in the flame, Manoah realizes he has been visited by God and fears he will die. Look at this. I'm going to show you this. Look at Judges 13, verse 18. It says, Then the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? You know that Hebrew word for wonderful there? It means incomprehensible. So think about this situation. Hey, I just want to say a uh, guy that I've never met, except for right now. Hey, when, when we get pregnant and like this baby comes, I just, I want to tell other people how awesome you are. So like, what's your name, bro? And you know what the angel says to him? Why should I tell you my name since you can't even understand it? The word wonderful there in Hebrew means incomprehensible. Like you, even if I tell you, you're not going to be able to understand. That, that, that's weird. That's a weird conversation. Like, what's your name? John, Greg, Mephibosheth? Like, what is it? Now it's, I'm not even going to bother telling you because it's so amazing. uh, Okay, (laughs) that's weird, but all right. And you know what that shows? Because angels have names, Michael, Gabriel, but this guy has no name. And it literally speaks to the fact that this was probably a pre-incarnate Jesus. Before Jesus came, physically got his body through Mary, this is probably Jesus showing up, interacting with humanity by looking like a man because no angel shows up like that, which is why Manoah says, we just saw God, we're gonna die. He recognizes it's not an angel, it's not a regular guy. So God's showing up in this situation, probably a pre-incarnate Jesus. I leave, this last thing I leave you with, our last principle is this, the greatest mission is to be moved by God to do the work of God. Woo, look at that. The greatest mission in your life isn't to make people Republicans. The greatest mission in your life is not to make people a Democrat or a mitten-wearing independent. You know what your greatest mission in life is to get people to see Jesus in you. It should change the way you interact at home. It should change the way you interact at work. It should change the way you interact online. Jesus should control your thumbs, is what I'm saying. Because your mission should be about attracting people to Jesus. That's your mission in life. I love this, that in uh, Judges 13, 25, it says, and the spirit of the Lord began to stir in Samson after he was born. Like that's, that's a calling, that's a mission. And I, I, here's the thing. I pray that God is stirring in your heart a desire to want to serve him, to let people know, not your political party or your social ideas or what you feel about a mask or businesses. I, I pray that people will know you for Jesus in you. Like that first Everything else about a mask and everything else, okay, you can state your opinion, but don't let that be the reason that people know you because your mission isn't masks. Your mission is Jesus. Other things are important, but it's not ultimately important. People need to see Jesus in you and their lives will change. God will use you for great things and nothing's greater than that than being used by God.